Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to start there. We're going to be looking at some different passages and texts of Scripture, of course, together. But here in Matthew 28, I just want to begin this morning by making sure we read this resurrection story. And I hope it will help us as we set our focus on the resurrection and what Jesus Christ has done for us. So let me read, if I can, Matthew 28. I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. Um, if you have a Bible, you can follow along with me. If not, just listen as I read. And I'm going to read here these 10 verses here from Matthew 28. It says in verse number 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Let's pray for a moment, ask God to help us during this message time, and then we'll get into the word here together. Father, we do ask you in this moment that you would speak to us. I do pray that you'd silence our hearts, that you'd quiet distractions, and that, Lord, in our hearts and with our minds would be able to give you this moment. Lord, those this morning that know Christ, we want to thank you for the resurrection. Lord, those maybe today that are asking questions about the resurrection, I pray today that you'd speak to every one of our hearts wherever we're at and help us take the steps that we should. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us, teach us, help us in this moment to give it to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to realize that whether or not something is real often makes all the difference. Whether or not something is real and genuine often determines everything. I am admittedly a fan of shows that sometimes are trying to esteem the value of certain objects. I find it interesting when someone comes in with something, whether it be to a pawn shop or from a storage locker, and they want to have this item that they think is maybe worth a lot of money or maybe worth no money, and they really don't know. And they call in maybe an expert and try and find out if you've seen shows like this, try and find out whether or not this thing has any value. I remember one such occurrence where somebody came in and they had this object that they thought was a photo of Abraham Lincoln and his wife. And right away, of course, if it was a photo of Abraham Lincoln and his wife, it would be extraordinarily rare, extraordinarily uncommon. And right away, the owner said, well, we're going to have to make sure we get an expert in here to verify whether or not this is the real thing. And the person obviously convincingly was like, I know it's the real thing. I've, you know, I've looked it up. I've checked on it. And he said, we're going to have to make sure, obviously, we get an expert before I give you anywhere near the amount of money that you want for this object. And they brought in the expert and, sure enough, looked at it and, you know, compared it with other things and said, look, you know, this photo looks like Abraham Lincoln from the fact that it has the same beard, but this photo is not Abraham Lincoln and this is not his wife. And the man, of course, was irate. He was angry. This thing is worth millions of dollars. But the simple fact was, as much as he wanted it to be the real thing, it wasn't the real thing. You know, whether or not something is real makes all the difference. It's important for us to understand when you come to face to face with the gospel message that they were written from the perspective of trying to convince others of the reality that Jesus Christ was the real thing. It was written by first-hand people with first-hand experiences trying to help people understand Jesus Christ is not an impersonator. He's not a fake. This is why the message is real, and this is why you can confirm it by faith. 
Now understand this, when you stand up and make a claim about any individual that someone died, was buried, and three days rose again, people are going to have differing reactions to that. Some people are going to look at that and say, well, that's kind of a fanciful story, isn't it? Maybe that deserves to be labeled somewhere in the fiction category of the library. How can I know, all right, how can I know that this is real? Because honestly, if it's not real, it's a major problem. If it is real, it makes all the difference. And so as you come here to this resurrection story where the Bible begins to lay out in Matthew chapter 28 and even 27 and 26, all the events that were surrounding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is Matthew, one of the disciples of Christ that was there, had firsthand experience, and he is writing to his fellow countrymen with this basic message, I want you to know that Jesus Christ is the real deal. He's the real thing, and this is why. And kind of woven throughout the resurrection story, woven throughout the crucifixion story, is Matthew trying to lay out these events with convincing detail of what he saw, of what he experienced, of what he went through that led him to the place to be able to convincingly say, this is real and it deserves your faith. Now, honestly, this morning, the decision you make personally as an individual as to whether or not this is real makes all the eternal difference. If you go in your Bible, and I'll just go there quickly to see why this matters, why this matters for me, why this matters for you, is if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you'll see that the resurrection story, in many ways, is the essence of of God's gospel message. And what I mean by that is how God desires to forgive the sins of people. How God desires to restore a relationship with humanity. And in the very centerpiece of that, that holds it all together, is the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when you come face to face with that story, what you believe based on that story, is going to make a huge difference. It really is the determining factor of whether or not God is able, based on his terms, to forgive our sins. So look here just quickly, 1 Corinthians 15, and hopefully you'll be able to say where I'm going with this. Verse number 2, it says this, By which also ye are saved. All right, that means this is how you're rescued. Rescued from what? All right, rescued from the consequences of our sin, by which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. You see that what you believe in makes a big difference, what you esteem to be true. It says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, that was the reason for his death, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And the Bible begins to go on, you'll see in the verses that follow, of the different people that witnessed and saw Jesus Christ resurrected. Right, but he's saying here, this is the essence of how you are rescued. This is how you are saved from the consequences of your sin, is because of the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection. So when we come to this story, and when we make personal decision of whether or not this deserves to be classified in my mind as fiction, or a fanciful story, or an extreme legend, or whether or not it is something that deserves my faith, is going to be determined on what you believe is true. And so Matthew, we're going to allow him, hopefully, God, through the page of Scripture, to tell us this is why he wanted us to understand that this event is not just a story, this is not something that people just dreamed up, but this really happened, and he wants you to know why. So we're going to ask this question this morning, how can we know that the resurrection story is true? How do I know that deserves my faith instead of skeptical fiction? First thing I want you to notice this morning, and we'll look through several passages of Scripture, but the first thing I want you to see is this. In Matthew chapter 27, we'll look at together. 
And that is this, Jesus Christ was buried. Jesus Christ was buried. Now, this is an important element to understand as Matthew is describing this, because he wants people to know the finality of the death of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ did not have, you know, a fainting spell, all right? He, he did not have some kind of experience in which he looked dead, but all the events of the crucifixion story are meant to lead any honest person to the conclusion there is no possible way that someone survived this. Let me read you just a few verses that I hope will help us. Matthew 27, uh, verse 57. It says, and when even was come, all right, we're reading at the end of the crucifixion story, after Jesus Christ has been on the cross, it says, and when even was come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. All right, Matthew wants people to understand Jesus Christ's body was buried. Now, in our culture, death has become something that is often clouded from sometimes the barbaric nature of it. In Jewish and Roman culture at this time, that was simply not the case. For many people, death was sport. Abusing someone's body that was headed towards death of this magnitude was something that you can see the soldiers enjoyed taking pleasure in the torture of someone else. It begins, of course, with Jesus Christ with his scourging, that infamous cat of nine tails that ripped to shreds the human body of Jesus Christ, left, you know, flagged, uh, left just torn to shreds in this situation. That's where the crucifixion story begins. Jesus' body, before he even goes to the cross, is so weak, he's unable to carry his own cross. He's put there on the cross, nailed, hung, crucified, in a barbaric fashion that when we just read this story, Joseph, after Jesus Christ has cried, yielded up the ghost, he is begging for the hanging body of Jesus Christ. Now that's hard for me to picture. It's hard for us to understand. But here these people had a common occurrence of allowing dead bodies just be hanged in public spectacle for people that would in any way stand against the Roman government. For them, this was fun. It, it seemed they enjoyed it. You see the story as people walk by mocking Jesus Christ and the others on the cross. This was something that was common. Death was not something that was made in any way natural or pretty. It was allowed to be barbaric. And the cross purpose was to publicly and brutally bring someone to the point of death. Now, we read, as we read through this story, we've gotten used to it. But if we would have lived there like Matthew did and saw the things that Matthew saw, there was no question as to whether or not Jesus did not survive this ordeal. That, that would be like us with Roman torture, thinking someone maybe could survive the hangman's noose or the guillotine of the French Revolution. All right, this was the most barbaric way to kill someone, and people took pleasure in making sure it happened. And this man, Joseph, who was a disciple of Jesus Christ this moment, who had a tomb, he had to go and beg, please, can I take that body that is hanging on that wood, that is left there for a public spectacle, can I please take that dead body off the cross? Matthew is trying to recount these events to make sure there is no question Jesus Christ fully and completely and unquestionably died. Now, why is that important? Because there's many people with the amazing evidence, both historically and biblically, that is out there, that Jesus Christ was alive after the crucifixion. There's many people that come up with all kinds of stories. They say things like, maybe Jesus just swooned. All right, that's something you'll hear even sometimes in Islam. Jesus Christ was just you know, under for a little while, and he went in the grave, and then he just got better. 
like, just get better. It's like, yeah, I mean, okay. Why is that? Because it's so hard for people to put together with all the evidence that is there historically and scripturally of a man that was alive showing himself to people after his death on the cross. They say there's got to be another explanation outside of resurrection. And so Matthew is going through all these gory details. He's trying to explain a brutalized body, a man whipped, tortured, nailed on a cross as a public spectacle, left there well after he was dead. Until Joseph said, please, can I take that body and can I bury it? Burial sets in, and I'm so sorry for those that go through grief, and I'm so sorry for the church family of ours right now that are going through grief, but burial sets in the reality of death, and that's one of the things that's so hard about it. You know, several years ago, um, I was out visiting out west, and I decided I wanted to stop by where my dad is buried. Uh, My dad passed away when I was six years old, and, um, you know, and, and I can talk about this. Obviously, I've had a lot of years to process it. But I'll tell you, when I was a little kid, my mom would tell us stories about the fact that she would try and take us to the graveside. And, you know, as kids, we would play tag between the gravestones. I mean, we just couldn't understand what was going on. I mean, my older brother was eight. I was six. My younger sister at that time would have been like three, okay? We just weren't resonating with it. But then as an adult man, the first time I went back, I think, to visit, you know, I was probably at that point, oh, either early 30s or late 20s at that point. And I remember, okay, just for me as an individual, walking to that gravestone, all right, and looking at my dad's name etched in there, and although I was not emotional, I mean, I've had a lot of years to process it, there was just this reality of the finality of it. I mean, this is where my dad is buried. You know where the Bible makes a big deal of the burial of Jesus Christ? It's trying to etch in this finality. He died. He was buried. It looked over. (laughs) It looked final. Everyone is grieving. Joseph is pleading for this body. He's putting it in his burial place. They're wrapping it. They're going through all that process. It looks finished. But of course, the story is not over. So the first thing Matthew wants to make sure everyone understands when he's trying to help people understand this concept, the resurrection is the real thing. It's this one. Jesus Christ really died and he was buried. Second thing this morning, how do we see that the resurrection is real? Second thing is this. Christ promised his resurrection and the Pharisees were afraid of it. Right? Christ promised his resurrection and the Pharisees were afraid of it. Look with me in a couple of verses. We'll see a few about Matthew 27. We were there. Let's look at verses 62 through 66. It's picking up right where we left off. It says, The next day that follows the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher, right, that's the grave, be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Okay, they're saying if he, uh, you know, comes out of the grave, obviously we're going to have a much bigger problem than we had before we put him on the cross. All right, they recognize that. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. All right? These Pharisees were given license to make sure the burial place of Jesus Christ was secure against something the Pharisees were afraid of. Now, Jesus Christ, as he is reaching the end of his earthly ministry, he is pronouncing to his disciples and to others, I am going to die. Get this through your head, understand it. I'm going to die, but that's not going to be the end. I am going to rise again. And understand, in a day without social media, in a day without email, in a day without printed page even, all right, this was such a common understanding that the Pharisees knew that Jesus Christ had made the statement that I will die, but three days later I will rise again. So much so that in their fear, they make sure trained Roman soldiers 
are providing security around the tomb of Jesus Christ. They want to make sure that no disciple, no poor fisherman with huge military training, you should see how Peter did, trying to wield the sword, right, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, just took off someone's ear, right? I think he was aiming for something else. But that these poor fishermen would obviously come and steal the body of Jesus Christ from trained Roman soldiers. And they're afraid of this, so they are given license. Make it as sure as you can. They're afraid and they react in that fear to making sure Jesus Christ cannot have a resurrection story. You know, when things make you afraid, you often react. Uh, I am admittedly a parent that is probably a little bit overprotective. If you ask my kids, they would probably tell you that. I remember the first time I started letting my kids go to the park by themselves. Say, it's not a big deal. It was a big deal for me, okay? Just work with me here, okay? Long time ago, don't worry, Noah, right? Eons ago, all right? But I remember those first days, and because I was fearful, you know, as parents, you're fearful of the craziest things. It's like, someone out there is going to abduct my children. I mean, there's, and we live in a wild and weird and wicked world, all right? But there are moments that you're just, you're protective of your kids. And I would let them go to the park, but every once in a while, every 10 minutes, I'd walk up to the bedroom window and, you know, probably every five minutes, to be honest, right? I'd be looking out the window. I can still see them. They're okay. And once they start allowed to go from the cells, we do like little time things. It's like, all right, you can go for 25 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. You're going to take a watch. You're going to come back to the house. You're going to check in with me. And because of my fear, there were actions that were taken, all right? Greater fears call for greater actions. You see where these Pharisees are at? They're dealing with a religious problem. This man has upset the apple cart of what they've wanted in the monopoly of trying to control the Jewish people. They've taken their religion, like much religion goes, to be mandates of men instead of truly from God, and they have messed up God's plan, and Jesus Christ has called them on it. They hate him. That's why they crucified him. The jealousy and the hatred that became part of the teaching of Jesus Christ. And they want it done. They want it over. They want it gone. And the last thing in the world, I mean the last thing they want, is for there to be a resurrection story. I mean from them. If that happens, man, you thought we had a problem before. We're going to have a huge problem afterwards. And this reality of this announcement by Jesus Christ led to the fear of the Pharisees. Helps us understand this, okay? The resurrection of story of Jesus Christ was not something that was put together by strange events that happened after he died. It was not like, wow, something really weird happened on the third day. How can we explain this? Let's talk through a resurrection story. That sounds good, right? No, it was something, event that Jesus Christ has said, this is coming. So much so, the Pharisees are terrified of it. They set up a Roman garrison that surely will protect anything like this from ever happening. But of course, the Roman guard could stop the disciples, but it could not stop God. And of course, the event of the resurrection story happened in spite of the fact that these men did not want it to. But it was not a story invented after strange events on the first day of the week. It was a story that Jesus Christ had announced. That's how we know it is real. Third thing I want you to see this morning, how do we know that it's real? And that is this, Jesus Christ's resurrection story changed lives. Jesus Christ's resurrection story changed lives. Now, The joy of being someone who personally knows Christ and walks with them can attest to the fact that Jesus Christ does change lives. I liked the song that we sang this morning that asked that question, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. But for the disciples of Jesus Christ, the change of life was incredibly noticeable and dynamic. Now, what do I mean by that? When you go through the resurrection story of Christ, Matthew, as he is accounting of himself and as he is remembering these events, he lets out information about him and the disciples that in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus Christ was being taken by the soldiers of the priests, 
that they all forsook him and fled. They all ran away under the thumb of pressure. He, he obviously is apparently saying, we did not do a great job standing for Jesus Christ in that moment. But what is very interesting is what happens with the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Something happened that violently changed the attitudes and actions of these group of men. Let me read you a few verses there in Matthew 28. Verse number 7 says this, and you see it through Matthew's account several times, this concept of Jesus promising the disciples, I'm going to see you again in Galilee. Now, Galilee was kind of a headquarters of operation in many ways outside of Jerusalem for Jesus Christ's ministry. This was the region where you see so many accounts of things happening of Jesus Christ. It was a special place for the disciples. But look at verse 7, Matthew 28. It says, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, that region, and there shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, you notice it again, Be not afraid, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. All right, and several different times, Christ makes this kind of announcement. Hey, we're having a meeting in Galilee. I want my disciples there. I want everybody to go there. We're going to have a meeting, and I want to introduce myself to everyone. And so these disciples come back, and we have recorded in Scripture the fact that Jesus Christ comes to them in Galilee. But you know what is so interesting is how this Galilean meeting changed the lives of the disciples. Instead of being men who were crushed under pressure like they were in the garden, they were men who went worldwide to their known world, spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Now, it helps us to understand that pressure often brings out the reality of what we believe. When it comes to parenting for my wife and I, sometimes, of course, my wife is a lot more in tune with the daily routines of the house than I am. Uh, my wife, for the most part, is a stay-at-home mom. She teaches uh, music as well. And every Monday while she's teaching music, it's my turn to take care of the kids. So I go home. That's when you know, I cook the meal and I do things, put the kids to bed. And, and usually that's our weekly routine is Monday nights, is dad night. And, you know, and my wife is so great. Usually she just cooks the meal for me anyway. You know, it's like saran wrapped in the fridge, right? <laughs> Slow cooker's already on. Or, look, this is how bad it is. I'll, I'll just let you know. My wife puts rice in the rice cooker for me. With the water, all I have to do is push the start button. All right? <laughs> so I, I have a good wife and a good life. But, or she thinks I'm incredibly incapable, one of the two. But there's a reality that in how our home daily routines function, there are certain things my wife does every day with the kids and certain decisions that sometimes are made that I'm not aware of. And sometimes when kids are young, like really young, they like to capitalize on that ignorance between parents, right? Well, mom said, you know, mom said that we could do this or, you know, mom said this was going to happen, right? And, and, and we'll go in there and I'll be like, well, you know, my wife's teaching piano. I can't disrupt her, right? She's with a student. She's with a lesson. And it's not time for me, you know, to you know, to go and ask her questions. So I learned something as a parent that was incredibly helpful. And it goes like this. This is going to be a basic example. Okay, if you're telling me mom said that you could stay 30 minutes up later, I will let you do it. But if I find out that that's not the case, tomorrow you're going to bed an hour earlier. All right? And this is kind of how this conversation goes. All right? And we have these moments where all of a sudden it goes like, well, you know what? Maybe mom didn't mean exactly that. <laughs> you know? And maybe let's take a step or two back and just, you know, take a look at this one together and, and just take a moment. You know why? Because when you get put under pressure, sometimes different information comes out. You know, people hate the concept of interrogation. Okay, but the sad reality is there's countries that use intense uh, interrogation, 
Because interrogation works. All right? You get information that you wouldn't get otherwise. We're not arguing about that this morning, and I'm not saying I'm a fan or not a fan. I'm just saying pressure brings out real information. Now, somehow you have to account for the fact that you had a group of men that were too scared to stand with Christ when there was just a few temple guards in comparison that were giving, uh, you know, a Jesus Christ capturing him in the Garden of Gethsemane in comparison to the fact that these same disciples went all over the known world from Asia to Europe to Russia, from all we can see scripturally and of church history, that these men went everywhere spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the vast majority that we can see, one, of course, the Bible tells us of James uh, that was beaten and killed for his faith and for his stand. For all of them that we can see throughout history, almost all, maybe with the exception of John the Apostle, died in some way for their faith. Peter is said to have been crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified by his, like his Lord was, that he was not worthy of the same kind of death. How do you explain that? All I can say is this, something happened in Galilee. Something from this meeting where Jesus Christ said, you're going to see me, and think about it. If it was you, and you saw that man die on that cross, you heard him cry out, it is finished, and you saw him give up the ghost, that moment of his death where you knew it happened, you went home sobbing, crying, burying your Savior. And then later on, you take a trip walking up to Galilee, which is a distance from that location, and you go up there and you see that man again. That would shock you to the bottom of your toes, the top of your head, and you would never be the same individual. And that is something you would die for. What I am saying is this. Matthew is writing this. He's explaining to people, these are the events that I witnessed. This is what I saw. This is what I went through. And I'm telling you, I want you to know, this thing might sound crazy. It might sound incredible. But I am telling you, it is real, and it changed my life. And none of us, all right, none of us were there. None of us can rewind the, rewind the clock today 2,000 years and stand at that cross. We have to go from the eyewitness examples of what we saw. We have to be able to see throughout history how these events shattered the known world, changed the faith of so many. Something happened in which Matthew walked away as a tax collector, as a man who had been so different before in his life, he walks and he says, I'm telling you, this was real. Now, I want you to understand this. For us as individual people, all of us are going to look at the story. And if I had someone walk up to me on the street and say, hey, I know someone that rose from the dead, I'd be like, are you on something? Right, Honestly. Before the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be a lot of people that would say, man, that just can't be true. It's got to be fiction. And as you hear Matthew pleading with his people, he's saying this, I want you to know that man, because everyone was talking about it, that man really died. He really died. I was there. His body was brutalized. We watched him hanging on that cross as a public spectacle. A spectacle. We were there. He was dead as dead can be. We buried him in a tomb. It happened. He really, really died. I want you to know that. I want you to know these events that happened and all the things that we went through. He says, I want you to know that Jesus Christ, this just didn't happen, but he claimed it. He said it beforehand. He said it to the point that all the Jewish leaders were afraid. They were scared. They knew what could happen. They tried to prevent it, but they couldn't. And he says, I want you to know, Jesus Christ said, my disciples go to Galilee because we're going to have a meeting. We're going to have a meeting, and that meeting changed everything. Look, I want to encourage you this morning. I don't know what your background is. I know many of our church family, of course, here. Uh, but I want you to realize this morning, the resurrection story is something that sounds outside of the book for a lot of people. But the question every single one of us have to make the determination on, is this something that is fiction, or is this something that deserves my faith? 
Is this something that is real or is this something that is not genuine? And can I tell you this, like anything else in life, whether or not it's real makes all the difference. And you need to take a look at the facts. You need to take a look at what the Bible says. You need to take a look at how this shattered the history of humanity, how this one day changed everything, and you need to make a determination that this is real. And if you're here this morning, you know Christ as your Savior, can I encourage you with this? Do not look at the crucifixion story and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as something that deserves anything than your absolute confidence. It is something that is real and deserves that reputation. And if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ, let me challenge you to look at the facts. Listen to the people who were there. I wasn't there. But the people that were there explained, this is what happened, and it was real. It lies at the center of God's plan of forgiving your sins. Because Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again three days later, proving something incredibly abnormal happened, lies at the center of God's plan of how God wants to forgive your sins through Jesus Christ. And he wants you to look at it, not as a fable, not as a possibility, but as something that deserves your faith. What a joy it is today that we can gather together and celebrate this truth. The resurrection is real. Let's pray together. God, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word, how it ministers to our heart, how it helps us. Lord, as I read the account here in Matthew about your resurrection, Lord, I have to be honest, I wish I was there. I wish I got to see that moment with my own eyes to be one of those disciples and how it would change and rock our lives and our world to be able to see that moment. But Lord, as we read it, as we read the witnesses of those who were there, as we read the experiences of those who gave their lives for the truths that they witnessed, I pray that we would allow it to be settled in our heart that the re reality of the resurrection deserves our faith. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that does not know Christ as Savior, then honestly, Lord, they're just asking the question, could this be real? Could this be true? Is there a chance or is it just fiction? Lord, I pray that you speak to their heart right now. I pray for those that are maybe younger in the faith, that they have accepted you as Savior, that you would just settle in their heart with confidence the reality of the events that were recorded here in this gospel. Lord, I pray in this moment that you'd speak to the hearts of people. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I just want to give you a moment to pray and talk to God personally. And you know, every time we hear teaching and preaching from God's word, we do want to ask the question, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What do you want me to learn from this? If you're a Christian and you know it, would you just take a fresh look at the fact that this is real? Look, the fact that it got so burned within the hearts of the disciples, the reality of the resurrection changed their life. It changed the way they looked at the world. I think we need to be reminded that the resurrection is real and deserves the same fervor. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior. What I mean by that is there's never been a time in your life that you've accepted the fact that you're a sinner, but that there is a Savior. That Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And you've made a decision. I will believe that. I'm going to believe that. I might not understand everything, but I'm making a decision to believe that Jesus Christ died paying for my sins and rose again the third day, proving that this was God's plan and that he was the Son of God. Would you take a moment with God and just talk to him about that? God, I want to make a decision to believe. God, I want to accept you for who you are. Would you take a moment with the Lord? The piano's going to play, and I encourage you to take a moment to pray, and then I'll come up here and close in prayer in just a moment.
Lord, I want to thank you this morning for speaking to our hearts. I want to thank you for being able to remember this morning the reality of your resurrection and how that changes everything. And Father, I do pray today that you just settle in our hearts everything you've done for us and that, Lord, you would speak to the hearts of each person here. Help us, Lord, to in confidence look to the reality of the resurrection for the historical moment, the spiritual moment that it was. Thank you for all you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here this morning. What a joy it is to celebrate the reality of the resurrection together. And I do want to say as well, hey, if you've got a spiritual need, if you've got a question, if we can help you in any way, please see me after the service. I'd love to chat with you and to talk with you. Uh, for our church family, of course, a reminder, we have the Allens with us. Uh, missionaries at Hungry, 5 o'clock tonight. I hope you'll be able to be back with us. All right, God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Great to celebrate the risen Savior with you. Well, thanks so much for joining us for our service today. It's my prayer and hope that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to your life. I want to share something with you that I hope will be a help to you specifically if maybe you have some questions about where you're at spiritually with God. And maybe you're not sure you've got forgiveness from Him. Maybe you're not sure whenever life comes to an end where you'll spend eternity, with God, in heaven, or separated from Him. Uh, we've set up a website that I hope will answer those questions for you. If you go to steelcitychurch.ca forward slash answers, there's some great simple videos that'll walk you through some necessary steps to make sure you understand what God expects of you. I want to thank you again for joining us for our service. And wherever you're at spiritually, I trust you've been encouraged and helped today. God bless you. Oh